thanks for the invitation as well. Um, so, as Lohan said, I'm going to be talking about techniques to predict translation or machine translation quality and also to predict errors in machine translation, which are two slightly different tasks. Um, and I, I know this is a broad audience, so I thought I would start with the, by giving you an overview on how we do evaluation and quality prediction um, in the field of machine translation, um, covering what we mean by quality to start with, and then covering very briefly some of the standard metrics that we use, which are based on a reference translation, on a human translation, um, to then move on to the topic that I'm really interested in, which is uh, prediction-based metrics, so when we don't have a reference translation available. And we discuss some open issues that are, I believe, uh, very related to the topic of the workshop. Right, so, um, so the type of errors we're going to be looking at here are errors that arise from automatically translating text from one language to another. So it's not uh, speech translation, it's text translation. Um, you probably have heard of many or a few approaches to machine translation from the standard linguistic approach, rules-based approach to some corpse-based approach, approaches, uh, mostly statistical-based, um, Google Translate-like or Microsoft Bing Translate translation systems, they're all statistical approaches, and there's some hybrid approaches as well. So there's been a lot of research over more than 60 years now, and I think we can say, like in speech recognition, that this is a technology that is mature. Um, there are people making money on selling um, either machine translation systems or translations, um, and yet um, we find very frequently um, errors that can be considered very grotesque. Um, and you see some examples in a minute. So, quality evaluation is core in this field. Um, so much so that a long time ago it's been said that machine translation evaluation is better understood than machine translation itself, which I'm not quite sure I agree with. Um, but it is true that there are hundreds of metrics there, and every year we see new metrics coming out, and there's a reason for that. Um, and it's basically because we don't really know how to evaluate uh, machine translation until nowadays. So, um, why is it important? Well, as in many other applications, we want to compare systems, we want to measure progress over time. Um, for statistical machine translation, it's particularly important because we have a step where we optimize parameters in the system, which we call a tuning um, of the systems, and we need a metric, an evaluation metric for, for that. And we can also do, of course, diagnose of uh, empty systems to try and find out um, where the errors are and where the system is making mistakes. And another reason that I like, particularly like, is to decide on fitness for purpose, on whether um, translation is good enough for something. And this is where um, the notion of quality is a lot closer to human, human perception of quality as opposed to just a score uh, given by a metric. And just a little bit on terminology here, I keep, I'm talking about evaluation and errors. Um, in machine translation, normally we, when we say evaluation, we refer to some aggregate score for either a sentence or a document, uh, which could be derived from error analysis, but for us, error analysis is the fine-grained um, analysis that we do at either the word or phrase level. It's normally based on uh, some linguistic input, um, and then so we, we tend to distinguish these two words, uh, evaluation and error analysis, and this is why in the title I have quality prediction versus uh, error prediction, and basically the techniques that we use are not exactly the same. Right, so um, why, why is evaluation hard, particularly for machine translation? Well, different from other applications like in speech recognition where you expect to have one possible um, good or, or um, correct answer, in machine translation, you can have many, and I know this is true for other applications as well, but this is a, a good example. And the notion of quality itself, as I said, it's connected to human perception, but it's also connected to the application that you have in mind. Um, so what do we mean by quality? Is it fluency? Um, can we re read this text and it's uh, grammatical and so on? Is it adequacy? So does it say the same thing as the source text? Um, is it something that's easy to be fixed? And post-edited here is basically fixing the translation. Um, and who, who's going to use this translation and for what? Um, is it an end user? 
like a Google Translate user who's just interested in getting a gist of the text, or someone who's going to be using the translations for, say, internal communications, so gisting again, or is it for publication, so I don't want to do any post-edition, I just want to publish the text as is, the translation. So these are very different applications. Is it going to be used for empty systems development, so for tuning or diagnosis? So if it's for tuning, I need metrics that are very fast and cheap that can um, be run over iterations very quickly. Is, if it's for diagnosis, it has to be more fine-grained. Um, is it for a post-editor who's going to fix these translations? or for other applications such as cross-lingo information retrieval, where you probably just want to get the words right and the word order doesn't matter. So for each purpose, there is a different or a couple of different metrics and ways of evaluating translation. So just to give you an example of what I mean, so the top sentence there is a correct translation given by a human, and the lower one is an empty output, and you can see there's just one word missing. So how, how critical is this? is pretty critical if an S, well, empty systems and particularly statistical systems tend to make this type of mistake. Drop words, insert words, it's quite common. So I would say it's critical if this is to be given to a, an end user who doesn't read the source text. So basically they just get the output and they don't know what the input said. Uh, but it's not critical if it's to be post-edited by a professional translator. It's very easy to spot if they look at the source text that there is a negation missing there. If you get, on the other hand, something like this, um, again, human translation and an empty translation. So this is sort of the opposite, right? It's, um, the meaning is the same. It's not necessarily fluent or the empty output, but it says the same thing. So it's okay for uh, an end user it's not okay for a post-editor because you'd have to do a lot of reordering, um, especially if you want to keep the style of the source text, which is probably a lot closer to this than to this. Right, so how do we measure quality? Well, I'm just grouping here everything that I know about evaluation in four bullet points. Um, of course, we can do it manually, and that can be by ranking translations from different empty systems or the same empty system by judging whether translation is acceptable or not by doing um, one-to-end point uh, scale judgments on adequacy or fluency or quality in general, by doing um, fine-grained error analysis and counts. It could be task-based, so you ask humans to perform a task based on the um, translations and then you measure quality on that task, like reading, reading comprehension. Um, we're not going to be looking at, at those manual metrics, but instead at automatic metrics. Um, and then, as I said before, there is a whole family of metrics that are based on some form of comparison between the empty output and um, one or more human translations, which we call ref references. And people like to use colors for those metrics, blue, meteor, tur, and you see umber and rose and other metrics like that. Um, and then uh, another family of metrics that uh, disregard references for um, a specific purpose, and I'm going to spend most of the time talking about that. And this can be done at different levels of granularity, as I said before. And basically, the level of granularity changes the, the not only the notion of quality, but the actual metric there. So let me just start and try to be very brief, um, talking about reference-based metrics. So they're basically similarity metrics, mostly string matching metrics, um, that compare empty output to one or more human translations. And the basic metric, basically, we in MT, we like to inherit things from speech recognition, so from the basic models of uh, statistical MT to evaluation metrics, at least the basic ones. Um, so word error rate is, um, is basically, it was used a lot in the past, um, not anymore in this formulation, basically because it's, uh, it's only looking at one possible um, output or human translation, and it penalizes reordering quite heavily. So if you have the right words in the incorrect or an alternative order, you get penalized by deletions and insertions. Um, there is a variant of that which we use a lot, it's called the translation error rate, which is basically the same, but we add one operation, which is this shift operation, and um, which means that if we move things from one place to another, 
um, if it's a sequence of one or ten words, we count it as a single operation, single edit operation. So in this example, I would have, um, I would have basically uh, one, this is the empty. So I have th this week, which is not here in the reference, but somewhere else. So it's one shift. And then I have two replacements and uh, one um, insertion here. So I end up with four edits instead of, um, instead of seven, as if you would count this as two deletions and two insertions. So this is a quite um, wi widely used metric nowadays, especially a version of it that's called the HTR, or human targeted TR, where you do this comparison not with a pre previously created uh, MT output or reference, sorry, but a post-edited version of the MT. So you get the output of the MT, you give it to a human to post-edit it, and then that's your reference. So a lot of the evaluation metrics um, nowadays look at this post-edited version instead of uh, previously created reference. So it's closer to the MT, basically. Um, another, the last metric that I'm going to cover, just because some of the related work uses it, um, is this blue metric, which is basically um, an average, a geometric mean of n-gram precisions. Uh, so the, basically how many of the n-grams in the MT are found in the reference. Um, and this is aggregated over sentences and over documents here. Um, <coughs> and there's a penalty for sentences that are much, much shorter than the reference because this is a precision-based metric, basically. Um, and in the end, what, what I have is just a product of this av average of the precisions and this brevity penalty. So this is very simple, very cheap to calculate, very fast, um, and it's used basically in every <coughs> single paper, empty paper that you see, there will be a score for uh, blue there. Has lots of limitations, but people still use it. Um, so just in general, this automatic metrics based on references, um, as I said, they're very fast and cheap. Once you have a test set created with a reference, you can reuse it, you can use it for system development, for tuning purposes, and so on. Um, there are more advanced metrics than the ones I showed that, for example, would look at variable ways of saying the same thing. So instead of just doing string exact matching, they would also do um, matching of stems and synonyms and paraphrases, penalizing these in different ways. Um, also metrics that penalize different mismatches differently. So if I miss a function word that is less uh, critical than missing a content <laughs> word. Um, and these metrics perform really well in uh, evaluations, uh, common evaluations that we've had in the past. They have a number of disadvantages, of it, obviously the fact that they're working at either sentence or document level here, so they're very coarse, so it doesn't, they don't provide information on what went wrong. Um, the fact that they use references um, have basically two, has two main problems there. One is that even if you have a couple of references or four, if you can afford to get four versions of a human uh, translation for every sort of sentence or text, um, these are still a subset of all the possible good translations that you can have. So you're still missing if you get something different, it doesn't mean it's, it's wrong. It's just different from one of your four references. And most important for what I want to talk about next is the fact that you don't have reference translations in many cases, like take Google Translate users or any online system, translation system. You have a, an end user looking at a, a translation. You obviously don't have a reference for it because it hasn't been translated previously necessarily. So how can you still inform this user on the quality of the translations. Or there are a number of other scenarios that I'm going to talk about in a minute. So this is the motivation for what I'll cover um, in a minute, which is this quality prediction metrics. Before we get to that, just a few words on um, the level of granularity of these evaluation metrics. Um, there was a talk in the morning by uh, Maya Popovic um, on, on doing error analysis, automatic error analysis. And there are some error categories or categorizations that people have been using for, for, those, uh, for that kind of work. Um, I just wanted to mention one, uh, basically a new error categorization that we've been creating as part of a project uh, called QT Launchpad. So Quality Translation Launchpad is a support action, uh, an European support action. And we're basically trying to systematically analyze errors that are made by empty systems and also by humans, actually, um, to try and move um, sort of the research community to look 
at translations that are nearly good, that are missing only a few things, or that are producing only a few mistakes, and try and make these translations perfect. Uh, so this is mostly for diagnosis. And so far, we've been doing this by manual annotation, but the idea is to move this work um, further to try and, and do this automatically as well, at least partially. Um, I'm going to show you the <coughs> one part of this error categorization. It's a multidimensional categorization, so we have a, what we call issue types, uh, same as errors here, and they're basically grouped into three main categories, accuracy, fluency, and verity. And verity here um, basically means uh, fitness for purpose. So if you're talking about this, I'm, I'm not sure you can read this, but for example, legal requirements. So if you're translating a text from English into French about some, um, some regulation that in France doesn't make sense, you probably have to change it. So they also to do with localization a little bit here. Um, but the other ones are the standards. So for fluency, I would have uh, content errors, mechanical errors, and uh, for accuracy, I would have things like terminology, mistranslation, omission, and so on. And this is only what we call the core categories. And if you look at the full set of categories, you have something like this. And I'm glad you can't read it, because there are too many of them, uh, basically around 120. And we don't expect people to be using all of them, but um, instead to be selecting from these things that matter for um, their purpose, basically. So this is a purpose-specific metric. Um, so this is some specification on what matters for that based on a number of things. And then some of these categories will be selected depending on this specification. Um, so as I said, that, that has been done only manually. If you think of uh, how we can automate this, um, and I'm connecting this to the work that Maya presenting, presented this morning. Uh, so there are metrics that can look at, again, compare the empty output to some reference and then try and spot errors of different types. And these are just, this is basically a subset of the categories from this very large collection that I showed before, the very frequent categories and the categories that can be detected automatically. And this is done by trying to do some form of word alignment between the empty output and this reference and then some linguistic processing followed by classification algorithms to categorize the mismatches as one of these categories. Um, and I'm hoping that, I mean, I'm just mentioning here one, one work, but this could also be done by looking at post-edited versions of the translations instead of references. Um, so you have a closer match there. And I'm hoping that we'll see some of that uh, later today by Catherine, maybe. Um, I'm not sure this is actually the topic of the talk. That was my reading. All right, so, so what we've seen so far, reference-based metrics, including sentence or document level metrics, and this word uh, level metrics based on word alignment. And as I said, the limitation there is the need for this. The main limitation is the need for this reference, which is not always available. So the other set of family, or, or of metrics, sorry, um, is what I call quality estimation. And in other fields, even in machine translation, some people also call it confidence estimation. The reason I change it to quality is because we're looking at other things that go beyond confidence here. We're looking at, we're doing it as a post-processing. So it's not done as part of the MT um, system. So we get actually a translation that's already produced. And then we try and predict the quality of this translation. It's not as part of the, the decoding process here. And the reason is that Different from speech recognition, we, no, we don't normally assume that there's an interaction between the user and the system here. We assume that there is a certain text we want to translate and we can't change the source text for various reasons. Sometimes the user doesn't even know what it says. Um, and we want to predict the quality of this translation. And what we mean by quality here can be variable. It basically depends on what we give at training time. So I'm going to talk about the approach, but it's basically a machine learning, supervised machine learning approach. So we give labels for quality on some training set, and then we try and predict these labels later on. So just some examples of what people have been doing. Um, so what we mean by quality here could be a binary decision between can I publish this text as is without doing any post-editing? Um, can the reader get the gist of the text? Basically meaning here. Um, how much effort it would be necessary to fix this text. 
And if you're talking about word level, what type of editing, if any, does this word need? So do I need to uh, replace it, uh, delete it, and so on? So as I said, it's a standard machine learning task. We extract features from data, and we give quality labels depending on the application here. Um, right. The only thing that I, I think matters for us here is basically, so these are the components, but basically what we want to predict, so what type of labels we, we're going to give and what fe which features we can use. In terms of machine learning, I've been using mostly standard algorithms, almost as black boxes, except for one experiment that I'm going to talk about. Um, right. In terms of the labels, these are things people have done already, including myself, but others. What we can predict, we can predict absolute scores for fluency, adequacy. We can predict absolute scores for post-editing effort. We can try and predict post-editing time, uh, average post-editing time for a given sentence. Um, rankings of sentences within a data set, ranking of alternative translations for the same source sentence, percentage of edits that will be necessary in a sentence, um, word level edits and it, their types basically. And we could also predict some automatic metric. This is how the field started actually by annotating data according to some reference based metric like blue and then trying to predict this metric. It didn't work quite well for sentence level but for document level it's not that bad. So in terms of features, um, this is just some way of grouping them. There's actually hundreds of different features, but I like to treat them as groups. So they're features that look at the source text, basically trying to um, measure the complexity of translating the source text, things like um, the length of from very, very simple things like the length of the text. And I keep saying text here, uh, in most of the cases, is sentence or document. Uh, but some of these apply to words as well. Um, things like um, matching of the words in the sentence you want to translate with the words you have in your training corpus if it's a statistical machine translation system. So words that the system knows, basically. Um, language model of the source is another way of doing it. And a number of others. And then you have things that, features that only look at the translation itself, the machine translation here, um, which try and measure the fluency of this translation from standard things like language model and size of the translation to <coughs> slightly more elaborated things that, I don't know, grammar checkers and other things like that. We also have um, linguistically motivated features here for the source, such as uh, the depth of a synthetic tree, if you have a parser for the language. And then we have um, features that compare the source and the translation for the, mostly for the meaning related um, prediction so if you have things like named entities in the source text, then you probably expect to have named entities in target as well. Um, and uh, there's lots of comparisons you could do here, including length and so on. And finally, we have these confidence indicators, which is information that comes from your empty system. If it's a statistical system, then you can use things like your word or phrase probabilities, um, the overall model score, um, and a number of other indicators. Information from the search graph, of your decoder and so on. Um, this, in most cases, people don't actually use this, which is why I decided to call it quality estimation instead of confidence estimation. Because in many cases, you don't actually have access to the system, like Google Translate. We basically don't know what's behind. We just get the translation. So we can drop this. So like in the first talk by Julia this morning, Surprisingly, I've done a lot of feature ana analysis here, and surprisingly, what tends to work better are the simple features, the non-linguistically motivated features, um, the ones that don't depend on the system, the empty system itself. And I'll show you a list. We, just a little bit of terminology, I call this black box features, the ones that when we drop this, everything else is a black box because we treat the empty system as a black box. But basically, this is just a list of what we've been calling baseline features, features that perform well across data sets and language uh, pairs and so on and so forth. And you see they're all very simple from number of tokens in the source and translation, so two features here, the ratio, um, average source token length, average number of occurrences of words in the target sentence, so if you basically introduce in repetition there, which is normally bad, uh, punctuation symbols, language model probabilities, 
And this doesn't need to come from the empty system. If you just have a, like, a large corpus of the target language, say, you can just build a language model um, of that language. It doesn't matter if it's the same that was used by your empty system, and so on. So very simple things. And they work fairly well. And you try and add more things, it, they don't work. Actually, they make things worse in most cases. So um, we have a framework to extract features called Quest for quality estimation. It's available as open source. It extracts those simple features plus hundreds of others if people are interested. And we have wrappers for um, machine learning, specifically for the scikit-learn Python uh, toolkit and for uh, Gaussian processes um, toolkit as well in Python. So this is all available if people want to try. Um, and what I want to do next is just to give you some examples of um, applications of quality estimation that we, we considered successful, and then talk about open issues. So the first one is some of my previous work, where we basically try and predict post-editing time at a sentence level. Um, and the way to evaluate that is I have two sets of translations for a given language pair. I basically, in one of the sets, I apply quality estimation models, and I rank these translations from best to worst, to predict as best to predict as worst. And in the other set, I don't do any ranking. And then I give these sentences to humans from these two sets and ask them to post-edit the empty output. And I measure time, and I fix the time. I say, you have one hour to do the post-editing, and I alternate sentences from one data set and the other here. And then I measure how many words there were um, able to post edit per second in each of these two sets. And basically, in the set where I did some ranking with quality estimation, they are able to edit many more words per second than in the other set for both language pairs here. So basically, as a ranking um, task, it works pretty well, even if I'm predicting something that is uh, very subjective, as not subjective, but very variable as post editing time. Another application is um, what we call system selection. So we have four, in this case, four empty systems producing translations for the same source text. And then I want to be able to select the best translation, basically. And I know um, I have a, a prior knowledge that one of the systems is, best, is, is better than the others on average, um, but not always. So the, my best system here is able to produce the best translation according to human assessment in 54% of the times. If instead I build models for each of the systems and then simply rank the four alternative translations for every source and take the one with the highest predicted quality, I'm able to get the best translation for every source in 77% of the cases. So there's a, a huge difference here. So even if one system is on average better, for other translations I'm, I can select the, best, the better translations by looking at predicted quality. This is um, work by SDL Language Weaver, and they're looking at document level classification here. And so basically, they're training their models using blue scores as the quality label, which works fairly well for document uh, level assessment. Um, and then the way they're evaluating is by ranking the sentences in each document. So we have a number of um, basically domains uh, with doc the different documents here. Um, but then they rank all the sentences in each of these <coughs> domains, um, and then they look at blue scores for each of the quartiles here. So for the top 25%, top 50%, 75%, and the whole set. And blue scores, the higher the better. So basically, just take one, this WMT data set. If I um, use quality predictions to select the, 75, so the top 25% of the translations, I get a blue score that is three point, more than three points higher than in the whole data set. So again, for ranking, um, it's, it works fairly well. And it works even better for certain domains or data sets with higher um, translation variability here. So for the top 25%, the blue scores are much, much higher than for the whole data set. So the, the quality of the translations is very, well, varies a lot in this data set. And they're using some just I highlighted one feature here, which is the pseudo reference, which is basically you give your source text to another machine translation system, 
and then you use that as a reference, you treat it as a reference, and then you measure the similarity between this reference and your the empty system you want to predict the quality for, or the, the translation you want to predict the quality for. So this serves as a reference if you have a very good system. In, this, in their case, I think they were, they're using Google Translate as their um, pseudo-reference here, but it tends to work uh, fairly well if you have a decent system. It's, a, it's, a met, it's a, more like a measure of a consensus between empty systems. This is another example which is um, at a very different level of granularity. So here we're looking at predicting edits for words uh, in two types. Either I predict that a word is good or bad, or I predict that it's good or needs to be replaced or um, needs to be deleted, basically this is an insertion, or um, shifted or moved. Um, this was work done by uh, IBM. And it, these are just different feature sets, but basically what matters is uh, the black one, which is the most frequent class, which tends to be the good, so you don't do anything. Um, and the last one, which is the, their best model. Um, so this is about 72% F-score, um, macro F-score here. And this is about 66% for when you're predicting the actual types of edits, insertion, substitution, shift, or good. So it's, um, it works, again, fairly well but they have a very, very large data set. And the way they're doing that, the way they're labeling their training data is basically by aligning the empty output to a post-edited version of this empty output. Um, and then their features will be patterns of um, things like source and target word, um, and if it's correct or not, or the type of edit, uh, depending on the, the classifier here. Um, they also have things like um, if um, they're very sparse features, um, if I um, have a, a certain word with a certain part of speech tag, and in the translation I have a certain other target word with uh, the same or different part of speech tag, then it's, uh, say, it's good. Otherwise, it's uh, any of the others. So they're very, it's a very large feature set, but they can do that because they have a very large um, data set, training set, so 2.4 million words, which most people wouldn't be able to have. I mean, is there empty output? post-edited by professional translations, translators. Um, and uh, they use that for a very interesting application, which is to highlight words, sequences of words, in this case, um, in a translation, either to inform the user or the post-editor. Um, and red here is bad, orange is medium, and the rest is good. Just to, they also use, use sizes, as you can see. Right, um, so just to sort of, these are different applications, but um, if you want to know more about the state of the art, we've been running shared tasks on the topic for two years now. There's going to be another one next, well, next year. Um, so far, we've done sentence and word level prediction as part of WMT, this workshop on machine translation. And we're predicting different things, um, mostly for English, Spanish, because this is the data we have. Uh, but this year, we have different data sets as well. Right, I should move on, 10 minutes, okay, that should be enough. <coughs> Open issues, um, so as in many fields, when you're collecting data to build these models, as I said, there's a supervised model, so you need some labels, um, and most of the times we get labels from humans, and these are very subjective judgments, especially if you're talking about absolute quality judgments. So what's a good translation for a human is not necessarily a good translation for another human, um, even in very controlled environments. <clears throat> so just to give you an example, we annotated one of the data sets for the shared task that I mentioned with one to five Likert scores that should reflect the estimated post-editing effort for a given sentence. So if you ask a human, in a one to five point scale, where one is, um, it needs to be deleted and typed again or translated again, and five, it's, it's perfect and there's things in the middle, if you ask them to annotate a data set, even if they're professional translators doing that as their um, part of their job, which is, was the case here, you get a lot of disagreement. So in our first round for this data set, we actually had to discard 30% of the data set because humans would disagree by more than one category in this one to five point scale. And we still had to scale the remaining annotations because some were more uh, pessimistic, than other, pessimistic than others, basically. 
So one possible solution there is instead of looking at this subjective quality scores, let's try and look, for more, look at more objective quality scores, such as post-editing time, um, percentage of edits. So we actually look at what people change in the MT and how much time they take to do that, how many keys, keys they press and so on. And you use this as your quality label. Well, it turns out that this is also um, subject to a very large variance. Um, I think Guillaume has also shown that in, in his paper. Um, but just to give you some examples, this is one of the data sets. It's a very small one, 300 sentences that we collected using eight translators here. And this is seconds per word, and this is percentage of edits, how many words they change in the output. So you can see there's a large variance here. Some of the, tr the translators are just faster than others, which is sort of expected. They have different typing speeds and so on. That's normal. Um, but you also see, see things like, if you take this A4 here, um, you can, it's probably the, it's the slowest um, type or translator, but it's also the one who made the fewer edits. So it's not just that it's, this person is slower, it's, it, it, they use different strategies to post edit. And this is just one example, but people have been observing that um, not only for post editing, but of course for translation itself. But for post editing, you would expect it to be a little bit more well behaved, let's say, because people are just correcting some draft translation. Um, so, so what do we do if we can't really, if we don't have, we can't deal with um, this variance, we basically um, cannot rely on multiple annotators. So one possible solution is to actually deal with this variance and use it um, as a, not just as, not just treat it as noise, but try and learn something from it, which is what we did um, recently in this paper. So we treat it as a problem of multitask learning, where we model each annotator as a task. And if you have other variants in your data set, like different language pairs, different empty systems, you can model each of these as a task as well. And you can have as many variants of tasks as you want in your problem. <clears throat> so we basically say that there are many possible good translations. We don't impose an agreement. We don't do any, I mean, we don't force agreement. Um, and um, the way we did this was by using a particular learning framework called the Gaussian processes which is a kernelized Bayesian non-parametrical learning framework. And the way we do multitask learning here is basically by modeling uh, this in the kernel. So instead of just measuring or instead of um, looking at pairs of uh, data points here, we're going to look at pairs of data points and tasks as well. So for as many tasks as we have. I'm not going to go into details, but I can talk more about it later if you want. These are just some results. Um, there's lots of baselines here. They don't really matter. Um, but this is for one of the data sets, this WMT12, where we had three annotators, about 2,000 sentences, um, and they were annotating data with one to five scores. And just to take one baseline here, is basically if you, what we did in the task was to build a model for each, um, actually, no. Um, yeah, this would be a good baseline. We basically build a model for each translator among these three, and then we take the average uh, error. These are error bars, so the lower the better. Um, and basically, this is a very strong baseline. Um, the error is um, 0 0.87 here. Remember that this is the scale, so it's not a very large error. Uh, but basically, if we do multitask learning, which would be this set of bars, we're able to get it uh, down to 0 0.84. And there's some other numbers that don't matter. This is a more challenging um, data set, the one I mentioned before, with eight annotators, eight empty systems, and we're trying to predict post-editing time, which is very, very variable. Um, so again, we had a number of baselines. And in this case, our tasks are the annotator, the empty system, and we also try to model the sentence, each sentence, as a specific task. Um, the motivation there is because you have sentences that are longer and maybe people will have different strategies and take uh, not necessarily longer time just because the sentence is long, but they will do different things because the sentence is long. And that has an impact on the uh, final <coughs> post-editing time. <clears throat> so we tried each of this as a task, annotator, system, and sentence 
For a system in sentence, we actually make the error a lot worse. For annotator, it's a lot better, well, it's better than any of the other models, and the other models are, again, individual models, pooled models where we put everything together, um, and some domain adaptation uh, baselines. But then the interesting thing is when we put all of these things together, annotator, <coughs> sentence, and uh, empty system, we're able to get the lowest possible error here, modeling them all as different tasks. Yeah. Right, so this was, uh, again, trying to predict absolute scores. Another way of dealing with the problem to avoid this um, subjectivity that is well known is to treat it as, um, or it's, it's, a, it's actually a different problem altogether here, but it's a ranking task, so instead of um, doing um, an absolute quality prediction for a given sentence, I'm interested in ranking alternative translations from uh, different systems here, empty systems. Um, the numbers don't matter so much, but basically the only thing I wanted to highlight, this is part of the shared task, um, this is correlation metric, it seems pretty low but because we're discarding ties here, but basically the best system here was better than doing the same task using reference-based metrics. So there's um, this potential there to learn from previously annotated data, but um, in a way that we don't need humans uh, in the loop anymore. We don't need reference translations. Um, and I think this is, yeah, this is another challenge, is probably the last one that I wanted to talk about, is the cost of annotations. So, as I mentioned before, IBM could get those very interesting results for fine-grained word-level prediction because they had access to a lot of data, um, but how, how well can you do when we don't have that? So this is um, one of our shared tasks this year, um, predict keep or good, substitute or delete uh, at the word level. And if you just look at the final column here, if you remember what we had before was 0 0.66, what we have here, of course, is a different data set, but it's a lot lower. And basically because we have a lot less data um, than they had. So the annotation cost is still an issue, especially for word level prediction. For sentence level, actually, this is some work that we've done recently, and we're quite surprised to find out that um, we need a lot less data than we thought. So this is basically some active learning um, experiments where we added instances to the training set um, in, in beans of, uh, I don't know how many here, but in small sets and we measured performance in the test set every time. Um, and we're plotting here, this dark line is a, an oracle curve. So basically, we are adding instances by testing how well they do with improving prediction on a test set. So it's, it's really an oracle. And we just wanted to see how well we could do uh, or where we should stop in terms of um, several data sets, how much data we would need. And the interesting thing here is that, this, again, these are error curves. So at some point, for various data sets, the error starts going up. And this is 0 0.65, and this is 0 0.7. So a significant increase here, which basically means we not only need less data than we normally um, use, but also if you use the whole data set, we're probably going to get a lower performance, assuming that, um, of course, if you're able to select the right instances here. These are some active learning techniques. They all perform fairly the same, but um, we didn't do much work on trying to improve them. This is what I, th I find interesting. So basically, in most cases, with 30% uh, of the data set, we could already get the same levels of performance, or even better, even with a very naive active learning technique, which just looks at the variance of the data. So we add more instances as long as they um, add to the variance of the data. Right. This was my, actually my last challenge. Um, so we're doing all of this for machine translation quality prediction. Uh, would we have to do something different for human translation quality prediction? And I believe there is a talk uh, on Friday addressing that, but this is also some work that we've been doing as part of this project I mentioned before um, on trying to predict human translation quality. It's actually a very different problem, just to, from my perspective. Okay, conclusions. I talked about many things. Let me just try and wrap up everything. So evaluation in machine translation and estimation is still an open problem. Different metrics for different purposes or users, different notions of quality. With this 
quality prediction or quality estimation, we can actually model these notions of quality better by looking at different labels of the data, which we can't with most of the reference-based metrics. Um, we can use this in real applications, and um, there's actually commercial applications using that already. In terms of error prediction at the world level, so works is still, I mean, all the existing works is still predicting general edits, like the substitute or replace and so on, or keep, not the actual errors. So there's no work on trying to predict exactly what went wrong with a given word. So we could try and do that from annotations performed automatically, like the work that was presented this morning. So if, or we, something that we're doing now is to try and build a data set with a systematic error annotations that we can try and learn from. Of course, this is very costly, but it's been built. And the other thing that I find interesting, but I'm not going to cover here, is um, the use of this either error analysis or prediction for model improvement. Um, not really sure this is what Michelle is going to be talking about, sort of. But there's some work there on trying to learn from this, from corrections uh, made by humans and also from predictions, from um, quality estimation at the word level or sentence level. And I think that's all. Yeah. questions or comments? One of the earlier slides you showed um, a bunch of dimensions on which we were evaluating translation, uh, yep. translation output. Mm -hmm. And one of the categories you talked about a kind of localization of the meaning of the translation. This is the one that had one before that was one yep. before the one that read. Anyway, um, yeah, local legal requirements are local mm -hmm. So that um, suggested to me that you might be considering what translation theorists call exegesis or summarization in translation. So instead of going for strict um, meaning representation, yeah. they'll either add some, something to explain it to a local audience or remove something yeah. that's not necessary. Is precisely. that intentional? Yeah. Do you have to that? Yeah, precisely. Yeah. I mean, this certainly cannot be automated. But again, this is a metric for mostly for manual error analysis. And some of these categories can be partially automated, but not that one. But this is what we're looking at. Um, I'm not the one doing that, but I can put you in contact with the person doing that. It's the FKI people. So other questions? I have one actually. Mm -hmm. So uh, one, one uh, issue is also is, uh, the fact that we so far we have small compara for training quality estimation system. Whereas uh, I'm pretty sure that in private companies the post-edition is very common practice yeah. and it is done continuously. So how could we do to actually <coughs> a bigger corpora that, that goes beyond uh, several thousand uh, yeah. words? Yeah, this, this was actually the IBM case because they, they do post-editing as part of their um, translation um, department or whatever it is. It's, I've been trying, and as part of this project, we have some companies that are collaborating with us, and they do send us some data from time to time, but it's like, for this specific domain, I can send you 25 sentences, and then 25 from the other domain and the other company, so it's basically almost, I mean, almost impossible. I don't know if people have different experiences, but because it's mostly confidential data, client data, and they can't make it available. You have the opportunity to measure the portability of the world quality estimation system when they are trained in one domain and when they are applying a different domain for all the general level. Um, I haven't done that for the word level, but I've done that for the sentence level. Uh, it basically doesn't apply very well. <laughs> so with this multitask learning uh, setting that I mentioned, uh, we've been able to model that um, different domains and different language pairs. and and then basically you're treating it as a domain adaptation problem, but that's within your kernel function, so you don't have to have an extra step for that. Um, then you can sort of get almost the same results as building individual models 
because you also gain from what you learn about the commonalities between these two domains, because some, some of the things are different, but some of the feature values will be uh, similar or correlate very well. So you learn not only from the differences, but also from what they share, basically, with this multitask learning approach. No more questions? Please,